On June 14, 1911, the Southampton port was full of people, and the reason for this was great. On this day, under the command of the famous Captain Edward Smith, a new, unsinkable, huge and luxury liner started its first sail. And it was not Titanic. The Royal Mail Ship or RMS Olympic was the first liner of the Olympic class, the leaders of its time, which became legendary due to their dramatic fate. Probably the most famous liner in history, Titanic, was from this class, and the youngest in the family was the Britannic, a ship which service also ended tragically. Olympic, however, had a long and full of events 24-year career, not as dramatic as his brothers, but not less interesting. The history of these giants began long before they appeared. The beginning of the 20th century was marked as the time of an incredible increase in traffic between the old and the new worlds. The ground transportation could not be used. The air transportation was just born. So all the work was on the ships that were growing incredibly fast at that time. In a way, the Atlantic became a track for the countries in their maritime race. But in 1906, the leadership of the United Kingdom consolidated itself when the Cunard Line Company launched two famous giants, Lusitania and Mauritania. Cunard's main competitor, the White Star Line, became an outsider, although more recently was the absolute leader. It was necessary to find a solution to this problem. The decision was obvious. In 1907, the leaders of the White Star and the Harlan and Wolf shipyards that built ships exclusively for the company decided to answer Cunard by creating new liners. Three new ships had to become the future titans of sea transportation. The Harland & Wolf shipyard, located in Belfast, was designed to build two ships at once. The Olympic was founded in October 1908, followed by Titanic. The Britannic was planned to be built after the first ship leaves the shipyard. The 882 feet long vessel was so huge that the shipyard had to be modified but the dimensions were a success. The Olympic was almost 92 feet longer than the Mauritania. However, the more economical power plant, which gave a lot of financial advantages, lacked the PR. The ship needed three funnels, and the competitor had four. Therefore, it was decided to install one more funnel, although functionally it was not needed, and was used just for ventilation. The ship was driven by three propellers, two on the sides of the hull and one integrated into the base of the rudder mechanism. As soon as the Olympic touched the water, it was immediately declared not only the largest ship in the world, but also the most luxury. While passengers of the second and third class were provided quite a decent living in the voyage, first class passengers were granted their own small palaces. There were also huge walking decks, restaurants, recreation areas, gyms, baths, and of course the main hall with the famous Grand Staircase. And other features, special elevators that were made only for the Olympic class ships. In principle, the ships of this class were almost identical. Olympic and Titanic looked like twins. However, based on the experience of the Olympic that sailed first, the younger ships received a number of changes. Because of that, the Titanic was almost 1000 tons heavier than its older brother, although their dimensions were identical. The sea trials began in the spring 1911, and after their successful completion, the ship went to Liverpool, to its port of registry. White Star launched a large-scale campaign describing the Olympic as the first representative of the revolutionary huge luxury and safe ships, superliners. The ship started its first voyage on June 14, 1911, from Southampton to New York. Media support was enormous. When it arrived to the United States, the ship attracted attention from the public. It was met by more than 10,000 people. However, the successful voyages were interrupted already on the fifth sail. In the same 1911, during the passage of a small strait in the northern part of the English Channel, the ship collided with the HMS Hawk. Passing close to each other, the ships sailed with sufficiently high speeds, and the giant Olympic actually pulled Hawk into her sight. The liner's hull got damaged, while the cruiser almost lost its nose. After the investigation, the liner crew was recognized guilty, which led to serious legal costs for White Star. However, this case was used as an additional advertisement. Even after a serious clash with the military cruiser, the Olympic was able to return to Southampton, which confirmed it is unsinkable. However, it still needed much time for repairs. 
The reputation problems and repair of Olympic fell at the high point of its younger brother, Titanic. Its first voyage was to become a great event, and it became. On April 14, 1912, Olympic was on its way from New York. The ship received a distress signal from the Titanic, but was too far, nearly 500 miles from the crash site. The ship of course went to help, but it was too late. A few hours later, the crew received a message from the ship Carpathia. Titanic is no more. About 700 people were saved. Nearly 1500 died with the ship. Olympic returned to its course. There was nothing it could do to help. Besides, barely saved people could be shocked to see a ship that sunk in front of their eyes a couple hours ago. When the liner arrived to Southampton, the city was already in mourning. After the disaster, the Olympic was sent to Belfast for modernization. First of all, the installation of additional lifeboats. The structure elements were also upgraded. Only a year later, it returned to the roads and was described as the new Olympic. Modernization was advertised as a solution to improve the comfort level. White Star maximally distanced its flagships from their sunken brother. However, the flagships soon lost the title of the largest liners in the world when the new SS Imperator with a tonnage of 52,000 tons was launched. Olympic met the First World War during its sail to New York. The liner continued to provide transport communications between the United Kingdom and the United States for some time. Then it was sent to Belfast, where it spent some time with the Britannic. It was modified, received some protection weapons, assigned to the Royal Navy as a transport ship and sent to the Mediterranean Sea. The war was getting more and more brutal. At sea it became obvious after the Lusitania's disaster in 1915, when with the liner, sunk by a German sub, almost 1200 people died. Olympic continued sailing, but after 1916 it was no longer necessary. It was painted in full camouflage and sent to carry out roads to Canada. And in the Mediterranean Sea, the Britannic continued to work. Its service was successful until November 21, 1916, when the ship struck a mine, blew up and sunk. In the family of flagships, Olympic was left alone. Despite some luck, the vessel got its portion of a combat experience. On April 1918, when Olympic was returning home, while crossing the English Channel, the crew suddenly noticed a German submarine in the surface position. They had opened fire, but without success. The U-103 mobilized and began an urgent dive, trying to escape. However, active maneuvering and tactics, led by the captain Bertram Hayes, allowed the ship to catch up with the enemy. As a result, the submarine, which started dive, was sliced by the Olympic's propeller and destroyed. What a story. Well, what can I say? If Captain Hayes was in charge of the Titanic bridge, instead the Captain Smith, on that fatal April night of 1912, the iceberg would probably be the one to sink to the ocean floor. After the war, the ship returned to the White Star fleet and was modernized at Harland and Wolf. In 1920, the liner returned to normal commercial operations, for the first time in six years. Soon, White Star formed a new trio of flagship liners. Majestic and Homeric joined Olympic. However, it should be taken into account that the ships were formerly called Bismarck and Columbus. And yes, both were given by Germany as a reparation. Cunard and White Star lost many ships during the war. Since then, there had been several more incidents with the Olympic, but mostly it performed quiet voyages without some trouble, earning the title of Old Reliable. Also, the sales history was not without mysticism. In 1929, the liner was sailing from Southampton to New York along the exact same road as the Titanic. Some discomfort from releasing this fact intensified when the ship started to shake for no apparent reason. The liner was in good condition and did not collide with anything. The fright increased even more from the fact that the Olympic at that moment was almost at the spot of the Titanic's crash site. However, everything turned out to be boring. The cause of shaking was the earthquake near the eastern coast of Canada. The Great Depression and the collapse of the economy had a very bad effect on transatlantic transportation, reducing the traffic by the mid-1930s by almost a half. In addition, the new generation liners from Germany, Italy and France started to conquer the ocean. The absolute Olympic became uncompetitive and unprofitable. 
In 1934, White Star and Cunard merged, releasing resources for the construction of a new generation of British ships, RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth. The old ships had to retire. The Olympic was supposed to be used as a summer cruise liner, then as a floating hotel, but these ideas were not released. The liner remained without work, standing next to it once major rival, Mauritania. In the end, both ships were decommissioned and demolished. By the end of 1937, the history of RMS Olympic was finished. The liner had completed 257 round trips on a total range of 1.8 million miles and transported 430,000 passengers. But the life of its hires continues. Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth served for a long time and retired, and to their place came new, even larger, more luxury and safe liners, whose history continues in the 21st century. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe and write in the comments what you think about this floating legend.